All right, so hello, I'm Floofpon. I'm going to be presenting on a new T9000 sample today. I'm calling this presentation Trashing the Pandas because I like raccoons, they're trash pandas, and Mustang Panda sucks. So who am I? Uh, I started out in Bug Bounty. I, I did my tours there, going through Bug Crowd, going through Hacker One. You know, hacking governments here and there, as everyone does. Um, eventually worked my way into doing a little bit of network penetration testing, getting a little more formal on things. Uh, I got sidetracked, thrown into AppSec for a while, did code analysis, learned SEML. That wasn't any fun. Um, but most importantly now, I thrunt. Um, I also really like raccoons. They're floofed up. They have fingers. They can, in fact, hack. But... Raccoon Stealer sucks. They give us a bad reputation, and I personally support APT69420. Lastly, and honestly, most importantly, I really enjoy theory. No perception, simply just vibes out here. So what are we going to be covering today? Um, my kind of goal is to teach people how to go from reading a write-up to finding the associated infrastructure from a threat actor. Uh, I'm going to be using mostly census for this, but there are obviously tons of other options that you can choose out there. So this threat actor, Mustang Panda, TA416, Stately Taurus, was most recently reported on by Curated Intel and Unit 42, but we're going to be covering the January and February campaigns. Um, as we will then learn, this will lead us to a sample of T9000V2, which is now an APK-based backdoor uh, with espionage features, new plugins, and... Basically, it's not a Skype stealer anymore because who uses Skype? So, time to learn a little bit about Mustang Panda. There are a ton of names that they've gone by. I personally hate the entire threat intelligence community for this. I can never find all the resources I need without spending 30 minutes learning names. But they're a Chinese Nexus group that has been active since 2012. They mainly use Poison Ivy, Plug X, and T9000, their own custom modular backdoor. So they generally target locally around China, so countries like Myanmar, India, that kind of stuff, uh, with NGOs, uh, government organizations like the Ministry of Defense, as we'll see, healthcare, telecom, all of that kind of stuff. And as China does, they target the EU and the UN. So for history on T9000, uh, it's a modular backdoor. It's been also known as T5000, Plat1, and S7000. These aren't the names that we gave them. Uh, it's what they put into their PDB strings. So they give us those for free. Uh, two really interesting write-ups that I found very useful in starting my research is the write-up from Unit 42 on the Skype Stealer and Silence's write-up from 2013 on GTA Panda. So what do we get from this new APK form? New plugins, uh, new strings, us realizing that they still use SVN instead of Git, and way too much spyware. So, as I said, we're going to be covering basically what we learned from the CCERT CTI write-up. Their deployment there was a signed EXE with an expired certificate that drops publload, and then an ISO with an LNK embedded that drops tone shell. The greater IOC that was shared here was a specific certificate name for um, an RDP certificate, essentially. And that is the Win-9JJA certificate. Uh, importantly here, we're going to be using Census, uh, who's been brought up multiple times in other presentations here. And I love Census. Uh, they have a lovely UI. They have a great query language. You can use nested queries, which I'll go into soon. There is an open and gray noise button, which by default makes this the best internet scanning service in the world. I mean, who, who wouldn't love an open green gray noise button? But they also like your posts if you tag them. And unlike a very specific other internet scanning service, I can use labels without paying. Yeah. Also, gray noise, sorry, you have your own slide at the end. Don't worry, this isn't just census advertisement. So searching for our pandas because it's thrunt in time. Basically, we're going to use our certificate that we got from the write-up and put that into the lovely issuer DN field on census. We're going to limit our query a little bit by applying um, only results for a specific ASN. As we see from the results on the bottom left here, there are a lot of ports 5633. Going based off of this, we can refine our query using the same service um, 
that kind of part of the query, which allows you to nest. So we can say, if one service, i.e. one port, shows this certificate only on this port and is in that autonomous system, only show those results then. It's a very useful feature if you want to go into clustering a threat actor infrastructure. Overall, though, the size of the Mustang Panda infrastructure associated with this specifically is around 1,100. The number fluctuates kind of based on the day and week, but this is a rough overview. Um, there is pretty big clustering within specific ASNs, such as Gigabit Myanmar, Severius, HVC, but there are outliers in GB Network, uh, Bang Mode, and M247. If anyone has done a little bit of thrunting before, no one likes M247. It's terrible. It's like only cybercrime and a few VPNs. But something important that I want to note is that essentially from me finding this to writing up and presenting it, they've changed around their infrastructure. Beforehand, they used to share the same certificate fingerprint across multiple C2 IPs. This has now changed. They are moving towards an essentially purely IP-based um, certificate issuing system. But with that, this also gives us, as researchers, a little bit more information because they are continually pushing out new certificates. Something that we can use here is looking at the issuing period and the issuing time. So for example, here are two IP addresses that are somewhat close to each other um, and have a relatively similar issuing time. Uh, March 18th of this year, um, around 6 a.m. These are all UTC times. Another example being here is um, a very interesting one, actually, is they are issued 14 seconds apart where the IPs are essentially 15 numbers apart within the actual last octet themselves. This to me points to a sort of automated deploy script of these where one second it can just pump out a certificate per IP. Um, again, just another example this time with you know, some pretty large distance between the actual IP numbers. Um, they're in completely different BGP prefixes. Uh, we've still got relatively similar timings, um, but once again, these are issued on the same day. The overall takeaway from this that we can have is that um, we have a very specific time frame actually from when these certificates get issued. Uh, so six to nine a.m. UTC. If we were convert, we were to convert that to Hong Kong time, we get two to five p.m., which lines up with general working times um, across Chinese society, especially with an um, you know government-sponsored work. But an interesting fact as well is that. We see certificates signed at nearly the exact same second, uh, multiple months apart, on IP addresses that are relatively close to each other. And as it turns out, I'm not the only one that's come to this conclusion. Uh, the lovely people over at Unit 42 uh, made this graph about a different TA's attacks on Cambodia, which once again points out these kind of repeated time frames of when they do in fact operate. Um, I chose this one specifically because, interestingly enough, we saw a lot of certificates issued on March 18th, which was a Monday, beginning of a new week. And once again, on the 18th of September from Unit 42's analysis, it was also a Monday of a new week, the 18th, with a ton of new activity. It's correlation. But as I was actually writing this article, Unit 42 once again uh, published one of their articles doing time analysis on Chinese APTs, including Mustang Panda. Their conclusion was essentially the time clustering in this image down below, which once again reaffirms that we actually have pretty strong clustering between um, 2 and 5 p.m. for most Chinese APTs, actually. Um, this is just a personal little thing. I adapted a, a small piece of theory um, to to match up with a little, a little threat actor lore. Um, you can read this once I publish the, the presentation afterwards, but yeah, just a, a small little Easter egg here. So where do we go from here? We find the Panda prints, or essentially their open directories, see what malware they're showing. And it, it really is as simple as this. Um, I looked for the certificate name and added the open directory label. We have an open directory. Wow. That's fun. Uh, we've got three folders here, B, C, and D. Oh, we've got an APK in here. 
that's fun. Um, so HTC Util, HTC Utils, all of these files down here, if you've spent any time with T9000 or Mustang Panda, you'll know this is like the basic standard um, Windows T9000 setup. But obviously, the APK is very new. Where can we go from here? Because obviously, there's not only a singular open directory. Well, this is where esoteric file servers actually come in really handy. So a lot of East Asian APTs as a whole like to use HFS for serving their files. Uh, Mustang Panda in specific here used HFS 2.4 RC4, which is three subversions or revisions um, old from the most recent release, which is weird to say because it was 2020. Uh, the use of HFS is pretty widely documented within like the Threat Intel community, but yeah. So if you want to find their open directories, all you have to do is uh, use this little query here. So HFS 2.4 RC4 on the server response header. That's all. Um, Ta-da. Yeah, these are their open directories. Uh, if they're hosting on 6.3 or 7.3.8.6, it's theirs. This one weird one in Sao Paulo. Don't know what they're cooking. Um, but most importantly, our original IP isn't here anymore, which sucks. Um, it got taken down. Rip bozo. Yeah. So let's check the other open directories. One of them turns out has another APK. Isn't it that great? We're going to be looking at so much Java today. I totally don't hate my life for that. Anyways, uh, the other two open directories don't have any APK, so we're not really going to take too much time looking at those. Um, and the files in there have the same exact um, modification date, so there's no reason to like compare them, essentially. So pivoting from here. One of our open directories, namely the one hosted in Russia, displays a Win-CLJ certificate. Uh, if you want to go to search for some of that stuff, here's the query for that. The reason I'm writing it this way is that we know that fingerprints are no longer like in full use for Mustang Panda infrastructure. So searching based off fingerprint alone won't really ever reveal the full infrastructure to us. Um, importantly as well, they run SMB on 445. So just for you know safety purposes, we added that in as well for the setup log target name. Uh, one of the domains that got taken down in the time of writing this presentation was Brooks Dawson. Very much you will be missed. But what this actually leads us to is a soft ether infrastructure, which is kind of their like exfil infrastructure, if you will. Um, but overall, I've been talking about this entire thing in regards to uniqueness and how they're changing things up. They're really not. Um, they still use Win9JJ on about 90% of their hosts that um, for this specific campaign I'm looking at, there is the gen server CN, which is something that will require an entire presentation itself. That's a rabbit hole I unfortunately went into too deeply. We've got a random TST certificate, some AnyDesk certificates, um, a certificate with UK, Saxony, and a random Gmail at the end. Um, yeah, we got some keyboard spam. We got some triple nine JJ. Um, we've got the soft ether again, and just other stuff that no one really cares about. So kind of going back to our initial query, now that we know more about the broader infrastructure, what else can we find in terms of like diffing between what we know now and what we knew then? One thing we can do is using census built-in labels, like for example, login page. Let's see what they're displaying on login pages. That'd be kind of fun, right? Um, these are all the IP addresses if you want to go check for yourself. These are in general what they look like. This doesn't look too good to me. Like, I don't know where this is going. I didn't call the phone number. If anyone wants to message them on WhatsApp, uh, go for it. Let me know. Uh, I, I'd like to know if they respond. Um, similarly here, we've got another thing. Really don't know what they're doing here. But again, not really the point of the presentation. It's more about what can you find. So TTC cert listed our 9JJ certificate as a definitive indicator for Mustang Panda. But what if we were to look for hosts that show that, but specifically not on the aforementioned port of 5633? We can do that by applying literal like Boolean logic to census queries to diff. 
This can be done via the not operator, or in certain cases, you can use um, curly braces for exclusive ranges. If you want to learn more, you can read the lovely manual and documentation that census gives you as every good researcher should. Anyways, if we look at the results on the right here, we get 22 results. Uh, we have eight in Malaysia, eight in the US, uh, and a lot of singular IPs in specific countries. Um, for just posterity's sake, let's choose Russia because we all love Russia, don't we? Um, this brings us to the 86.105 IP address. Um, it has quite a few ports open, some very weird high ports that don't have detected technologies, um, multiple ports showing soft ether. Um, and once again, this weird pattern of the UK Saxony returns, uh, this time with a different email address. If anyone knows about that one, again, please let me know. But one thing we can do from here is not only just randomly search through IP addresses, but actually use this pattern to search through certificates themselves, which census also indexes. Yay. So if we were to look for this UK Saxony pattern, um, which is a weird one because that's two different countries, um, you would find four certificates issued between the 27th of February and the 15th of March of 2023, each with a 10,000 day period. Um, if you want to then go back to that and search for any host that shows those certificates, you can just wildcard fill it within the subject DN and census will do the rest for you. Um, this leaves us with six results here uh, with some very interesting domain names like uh, Concerebi, India Cloud 4, online, on liveserver.com. Once again, the M247 pops up. Um, if anyone has like any input, any ideas on these certificates, please do let me know because this is just a rabbit hole I never found an answer to because I don't see why like a certificate referencing the UK and a random state in Germany would be relevant to India, Singapore, or Malaysia. But yeah, um, we kind of have also seen the usage of M247 quite a bit throughout here. So if we look at the IP addresses exclusively in M247, we will find two of those, a 146 and a 91, both showing new certificates um, that are in fact pivotable, as well as new port combinations. Uh, if you want to look at the certificates yourself, go for it. A fun thing that I noticed about these new certificates is in fact that these are not issued for 10,000 days, but 100,000 days, um, which becomes very noticeable once you see that the validity period says to the year 2,297, which is kind of far out there if you ask me. Um, and another interesting note is that they have very specific keyboard spamming. So if you were to look at the letters that they use for all the attributes of the certificate, it, those are all found in the like middle row of your keyboard. So like your ASDFG row. Um, but obviously a huge issue of the year. Those aren't trusted certificates. They're self-signed. Um, if anyone's into the Dongwa Jinlong meme, I did a little thing on the side here. I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but the point being, it's just like not good tradecraft in my opinion, because this kind of stuff immediately stands out. And I feel like if any, even baseline AI were to look over that, that would at least be heuristically flagged. So what can we do from here? We simply do the same stuff. We pivot like before. We use the port combo with the 9JRP, the new certificate and we get 78 IPs. If we only use the CN, we get 81. Uh, this time we actually see very strong clustering in M247, which is more of like a cybercrime ASN, not really like a like hidden APT ASN in my opinion. But all that said, we get a new certificate that we can once again pivot from. Cool, fun beans. This can essentially go on indefinitely. Uh, and that presentation could be this, but it's not. So here are some tips of how you can keep hunting on census. Uh, follow the certificates, honestly, at all times, because certificates are really important and are quite standard across most APT infrastructures. Use labels, read documentation so you don't mess up your queries and you actually know what you're doing. Um, don't limit yourself to only a singular platform. Obviously, you can use Gray Noise, there's Shodan, Alien Vault, Validin, tons of others. 
Some things that I've learned to filter by that are really effective is ASNs, for example, which gives really good information on clustering. Um, a sub part of that would obviously be filtering by BGP prefixes. For technology specifics, you can use the URI, the vendor product, the banner, and the banner hash, um, all as things to differentiate between, for example, versions and campaigns, clusters, all of that stuff. But the point I'm trying to get across is that you can filter by any response attribute because TAs like to repeat things. They have run books, they have playbooks, they will continue doing things until they physically can no longer. So abuse that mindset. It makes it easier to follow them. Anyways, time for the actual Telegram Stealer spyware. Yes, T9000V2 is a Telegram Stealer in most of its functionality. So if we were to upload this to virus total, hybrid analysis, whatever, the A.APK that we found is in fact detected. That's cool. Um, so like, how did no one ever really know about the fact that this APK existed? Well, I don't know. But what we do know is that we're dealing with multiple versions of T9000 within one open directory slash campaign here. Um, we have a new debug string that was found in the Resin32, which denotes an exclusively for Shanghai. Make with that what you will. Um, and obviously, all of these are linked here. Um, these aren't new, really. Like these have been known about just the specific debug string I haven't seen mentioned anywhere else. Um, one thing that I noticed in my analysis is that there are two APKs that have generally the same code, but only one of them actually works. Um, the newer version has an embedded uh, encrypted APK called Google, but nowhere in the code do they actually, you know, adapt to that fact that it's called Google. Um, they still just call it patch.apk. So have at it. Uh, thanks to some of my friends in high places, uh, due to telemetry, we know that this has been in use since March 13th. Um, Apologies for your screenshots here, but the control flow is a little, it's a little interesting. So we have an A.APK, which to my understanding, the initial access vector is that they do, in fact, the end user installs it themselves. Um, it, I don't really see a reason or like any way that there would be a forced entry kind of thing. It, yeah. But this contains two other APKs, the 3.APK and the quote unquote patch.APK. The 3.APK is essentially just an exclusive telegram stealer. Um, and the patch.APK contains the quote unquote proper C2 functionality, including config decryption, call hijacking, all of that kind of fun stuff. Uh, some things to note here from the get go is that um, they spelled one pixel, one pi XL. And that's something that will repeat itself throughout all binaries because they in fact call back to that function multiple times. Um, so yeah, there will be a lot of spelling errors that are shown in here. Um, and if I have to suffer through it, so do you. Interestingly, they also just leave their Baidu location API key in here. Um, I did in fact test this. Uh, it, it was manually disabled by the operators themselves. It says so in fact in the, in the error message. But um, yeah. Maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll make a new API key at some point, but it's interesting to see that they are using like quote unquote regular location SDKs to actually exfiltrate their data. Um, so screenshots suck. I know you detection engineers want to paste things. It's actually pasteable text here. So the mainly important stuff from the A.APK APK is initializing through the. Um, supposed to be daemon activities, they spell it DEA again, um, and the associated locker functionality. Uh, for Android people here at the permissions that this APK specifically requests, uh, some interesting stuff is like record audio, process outgoing calls, read phone state, write contacts, uh, access find location, stuff that just regularly doesn't seem, you know, safe. But our loggers turn out to be code execution because just like log4j, when aren't your loggers just code execution? So the daemon activity calls into basically anonymous functions A, B, and C. What do these anonymous functions do? Um, 
One of them is privilege escalation via like just the native add device admin. Uh, one of them is an activity listener via an intent. And the third one is us running power detect service via sh-c, which uh, I'm prefacing all of this and I'll get into it later. My entire history of reverse engineering is based around Windows. I, I really don't move outside of Windows reverse engineering and malware analysis. But this just doesn't seem normal for an Android app. So if we were to go in and, and look at what this e.a.a call is, which is what the C function calls, it is literally just runtime.getruntime.exec with the whatever argument is passed. Fun, cool stuff. And they do it another time. Uh, and they do it another time as well in another function. Um, they've got like four different versions of just running get runtime.exec. It, it's something. But one thing that caught my eye during this is the specific kind of logging tags that they have applied. So this do STH by SU um, doesn't seem very normal to me. So I decided to Google it. Um, if you Google it, there are various Chinese like code articles like CSDN, for example, that come up. And turns out this article is actually the exact code that is used in this. Um, apologies for the screenshot here on the left. This is how the website renders. I couldn't even copy paste off of it. So this is this is what you're getting. Um, but yeah, basically we we see that this code is in fact just reused as this do STH by SU inside the APK itself. But what is this power detect service that you know is actually called by this shell, the by the shell command? If you guessed that it didn't detect power, you are partially correct because later on they do detect power, but um not here. This this is for dropping and decrypting the embedded APK. So being anonymous classes, the naming doesn't necessarily help us and there can be conflicting overlaps, which um, JDX will point out to you. But the point is um, we call a.c from the onStart command of the power detect service class, which eventually calls a.b with the patch.apk path. And that will likely be our decryption routine, logic would tell us. It is. Uh, so now it's time to reverse decryption algorithms. If you know a bit about Mustang Panda, they like using RC4. Um, yeah, it's basically just uninitialized RC4. It's super duper intense stuff. And this is all done by copying the Java code and running it myself. And guess what? Guess what? I had to wait 0.2 seconds. I got output. Did we do it? Yeah, we did. Yeah, it, it really was that easy. There's there's not much else. There's not much else to it. Um, but yeah, we we see the PK header for the zip. We see the meta inf manifest. So this this looks like a legit APK. So yeah, we did do it. Also, stop doing Java. No one likes Java. Please stop. Um, we're not skipping the three dot APK, although we just decrypted the patch uh, because we are in fact interested in what the three dot APK does. So the three dot APK, as mentioned before, is primarily for Telegram parsing. Uh, it implements. A telegram control info and parser classes as well as some other stuff um, one thing that i enjoyed a lot looking through this um, was that they had the intent category launcher and i i i miss my launcher a lot but yeah more permissions they can't spell permission either sucks um but yeah, there are some really interesting ones that I noted here. So like update app op state package you you should usage stats, sorry. Um, interact across users full, um, mount on mount file systems, the vibrate functionality, which is kind of cool, and uh write secure settings. Very, very benign permissions to ask for here. So um how do they control the T, the T that you're sending across Telegram? Um well they essentially kind of just set up a file copy of the cached telegram dbs and they parse based off of that so uh the big thing kind of here is something that you could also write detections based off of is like cp uh data data or telegram messenger files uh, cache 4.db 
dash shm. Um, in my opinion, something that wouldn't be too difficult to write on. But going from there, all the operations are exclusively done on cached and relocated DBs of Telegram. Uh, how do they parse this? They actually use the Telegram RPC methods. Uh, so right after grabbing the caches, they are going to parse it until they find essentially the self user. Um, and, you know, oh, my bad. This is the whole query that they use um, to find all of the data that they need. So one thing that I learned from this is actually that deleted accounts remain in the Telegram DB. And this can like programmatically be detected um, by basically having an empty friend account name. But more importantly, things that they exfiltrate to logs, for example, is um, first name, last name, phone number, your location through longitude, latitude, uh, the like V card from Telegram, that kind of stuff. So what's the kind of control flow of this? So we call the initialize function from Telegram control, which creates the parser class and loads the parser. This is where the actual big Telegram RPC stuff will come into play. This is all the stuff that they um, try and get out of the RPC classes. Um, it, it's a lot. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but the point is that they actually did a decent job of reading the Telegram SDK and what is necessary to read and parse the actual data sent through the app. If you can imagine reading through that and trying to analyze it when I saw it, it was terrible. Hence, I'm about to derealize. There's way too much code in this class. Um, I don't feel like learning the entire Telegram SDK. I'm getting tired of screenshotting. And remember, this is still 3.apk. We have an entire encrypted APK to still cover. But importantly, what do they care about? They care about attachment data, metadata, uh, friends and connections, secret chats specifically, and locational data. So an interesting thing about their uploading is that they go through like eight to 10 different hoops to just upload data. Um, so their pre-upload will call into pre-upload text, which has different overloaded versions. If there's an attachment, you get it with file. Um, the point being is that if there is a file that is attached, it will actually get compressed via the native deflator class. Um, things that are included in those logs, once again, are going to be things like the friend account names, um, the time things were sent at message types, whether or not specifically there were secret chats, um, attachments, that kind of stuff. Um, how do they prep this data? So they actually write a pseudo header, uh, which you can see in the top right here. So they create a new byte array output stream and eventually write some data into it, um, as well as an empty 260 byte array. The data itself is XORed by the value of 121 or hex 79. That is also eventually written into the P header itself. So basically when decrypting in their um, uninitialized states, they will have the XOR key built into the part of memory that they need. That's kind of the purpose of that. Um, so basically they write most things to log files occasionally things to other locations like slash temp, and they will have an intent that periodically queries those locations and will eventually exfil them to wherever it is. So point being, we can move on now from telegram parsing. That stuff was kind of boring. So it's time for T9000 v2.0.8. How do we know that? Because they left us that in PDB strings. Once again, um, with a keen eye, you'll see that this is, in fact, because they compiled OpenSSL in debug mode. So thank you for that. Um, here's a general overview of what the decrypted patch.apk looks like if you were to just load it into JADX. Um, we've got a ton of stuff. We've got a ton of receivers, um, obviously new permissions. But at this point, going through this, like when I was analyzing it, I was thinking to myself, if there's a god, they do in fact hate me because everything I've encountered here, aside from the first like four T9000 things from the open directory, is completely outside of my ballpark. I'm having to learn the mobile matrix. 
do ELF plugins. I don't like those things. I like Win API. But I have IDA. I can press F5. And on top of all of that, Mustang Panda sucks at making malware. Anyways, the patch to APK is genuinely huge. Um, there is still even more code than this in it. I just tried to cover like most of the important things here in these screenshots. So I'm not excited for more Java. Uh, I don't know if you are, but there's a few fun Easter eggs. So the whole part of do STH by SU from earlier, um, we actually just get that with proper function names here. So we didn't really have to do that earlier, but I didn't know that back then. And it's, uh, it's just a fun exercise. But back to important things. We've got more permissions. Um, once again, this is just so that people can paste it into detection stuff. Um, once again, the API key is in here. They're still misspelling 1PyXL because they have to call out to that function. Um, but the most important thing here is like the upload file receiver, user present receiver, essentially all of the receivers that exist in here. So what does the main entry of this file actually do? Um, it has a function called task handle CSC, which is kind of like a secondary C2, which specifically deals with um, contacts, calls, and that kind of stuff. Parsing plugins, um, we create the call contact and SMS observer, which is kind of these, what CSC stands for. Um, all these do is essentially read from content SMS, content call log calls, and the content URI here. Um, the more important stuff happens in the task receivers over here. So like um, the user present receiver, the upload file receiver, for whatever reason, they're starting a Java server. Um, st take PO stands for take photos. So it, it's more along those lines of using receivers and filters for intents and activities in like a seemingly or an Android native coding style. So... We don't know why we boot a Java server because the function's not implemented in here. But yeah, some very fun typos that I noticed is that they spell record with OA. Um, they forget the R in information and type it as information. Um, and they add an E for cure location long. Don't ask me. These are just things that stood out to me while reading the code. Deep cut. Um, so handling C2 tasks. So the handling is done via Android messages and specifically the dot what uh, part of the Android message. There's a lot of commands with indexes and it is just one huge switch statement as we see here. Uh, so I, I kind of listed them all out here, but we're going to go into depth of each one, each of these um, in the upcoming slides. But interesting stuff is like um, audio recording specifically, grabbing SMS info, um, video recording that is split between the front and back camera, um, screen capture stuff, normal spyware things in all reality. But how much spying do they actually do in the spyware? So in our first case, we call to get location state and start record service. The get location state is implemented via the Baidu location SDK, which makes sense considering you know they included a Baidu API key. Um, the audio recording is basically just done via native audio record classes. Um, there's nothing really too fancy about that. Um, the screen state change is essentially just to check when a screen state has changed. Um, then with the location SMS and XOR, they basically grab the location, go into the SMS manager. Um, they eventually send a test SMS in the sense of they add it to the local SMS database. Um, but any data that goes through this process here is actually custom XORed via this um, like function, this A function on the right here, um, which, yeah, I, I really haven't bothered to dive into it too much. But Another interesting indicator here is the fact that they use um, Weidu and Jingdu for their latitude and longitude, like within the string builder itself. But next up is contact enumeration. Um, so there are four kind of main things in here, but two main functions. Uh, the get all phone numbers and get all email. Uh, 
all of this enumeration and querying for these things is done via the built-in Android content resolver. Uh, and they use basically the dot query functionality of it. Uh, most of these um, queries for enumeration are time-framed or time-gated, however you'd like to call it, because they do in fact include um, like a check here for the contact last updated timestamp. Um, for call log enumeration, it's a very similar thing, different attributes. This time we have find person, get last call log content, that kind of stuff. We grab it from um, contact contacts as uh, content contacts people, um, look for the display name, get name number, call duration, all that stuff. SMS, again, very similar, very similar thing. It, it's just content resolver over and over again. Um, now, we get to some more interesting stuff, though, which is grabbing the actual phone information. So what they grab, for example, is your phone's IMEI, your IMSI, the kernel version, Android version, patch version. Um, additionally, like your battery level and your signal level as well. Uh, and this stuff for a little bit of detection is stored in a file with a 133A0D8 underscore prefix. Don't ask me. Um, but for additional stuff is, um, like for detection wise, is for example, them running sh-c for get prop and grepping the sim state. Uh, they also directly access uh, sys devices system, storage external SD card, and the slash proc uh, directory. So for taking photos, this is where we actually reach back to our like initial APK with the one pi XL functionality. So essentially, if the SDK version is at a certain level for like the build SDK, they will only use internal methods instead of using the intent for the one pi XL activity. Uh, so the breakdown can kind of be seen in those. Uh, in the local implementation, you will have stuff like um, prefixing files with different um, three-letter prefixes to denote what type of photo was taken. Um, additionally, they also create a custom preview pane when the camera device is actually pulled up. So to my understanding, at least they are creating like a fake camera window that will actually just send pictures to them instead of properly like saving them to disk in that sense. So after that comes the first run mark, um, which interestingly is at case 14. But what this does is that it essentially starts the DCIM monitor. So it just starts a monitor for any file changes made to the like photos directories. It creates um, like a mutex of sorts in that sense by creating various marked files in specific folders to tell other versions of the malware the system has been affected already. Um, it writes itself to system um, and then begins telegram parsing. Uh, beyond that, more video things. So these prefixes, um, a few slides back, were basically the same two letters, but instead of V, it was P for picture instead of video. So there's very much a repeated naming scheme going on through here. Video and photo configurations actually have their own plugin, which is saved in the 5.cfg, which we will get into shortly about how to decrypt it. Most importantly, um, as I mentioned earlier, they differentiate between front and back videos and photos. So essentially there's just different C2 commands implemented for those. Uh, based again off the SDK version, it will either call out to one Pi XL or the built-in this time take video control. Um, this basically just calls the built-in camera wrapper, um, which includes custom encoders and decoders for video streams. That's not something that I'm personally too interested in, but it is something that is included. Um, they do stop the videos, which is like, wow, that's so kind of them. So cool. Not really. Um, it's just so that they can do basically timed video espionage. So one of the things that they do is based off the config, they will have start and stop times. And if a certain flag is set, it will record videos on specific dates at certain times for that parameter. And it'll just use the start slash stop um, command infrastructure that we see here. 
Uh, so updating plugin five, the five eyes do in fact see all. Uh, there are two parts to the plugin five decryption. One part is the like call decryption, and the other one is the camera config decryption. Uh, the reason why one of them has the haha ha dot prefix, I will get into soon, but basically they just wrote haha ha while decrypting that. So I decided to go with that naming scheme. Basically, um, you will have a few options here, like if it should take photos, should it automatically take photos? How often? Um, how often has it already done that? Should it record video? That kind of stuff. Um, as well as in the record info itself, this for call recording, um, like essentially a magic header, um, like specific environment levels for hiding stuff, um, just various call recording stuff. Um, but in essence, what this all comes down to is for the sample that I had here, um, this is the full config decryption. As it turns out, auto record video is turned off, but auto take photo is turned off or is turned on. Um, but yeah, shout out to them. Their configs are garbage, like honestly. And you should really stop embedding plain text API keys. Like, it's like I'm entering a new bug bounty program for the first time. Uh, if you want to do this yourself, uh, this code is copy pasteable. If you want to, I wouldn't suggest using it. It's terribly written code. I didn't care for the look of it, but it works. So last but not least, the actual screen capture functionality. Um, it captures the screen via, via creating a virtual display, which only really works if you have uh, the permission for it. Hence that kind of thing, why they check um, if they do have root, but they do also have another option in case that doesn't work. Regardless, uh, they do a lot of timed recording tasks. So they have two different options. One is for an only singular timed run, and the other is for a repeated timed run. So that kind of calls back to the um, like use auto functionality of the configs is that if they want to create continued scheduled recordings of a specific phone's activities, they can use the scheduled continued options to run via broadcast and intents. Now, I know I'm getting kind of tired here, and I know you're probably getting tired here, but it still doesn't end. Um, because there's more. There's more C2 commands. I, Yeah. Um, it, it really was a pain. I, I truly spent weeks on this. Um, I, I found a different sample, just because I was so bored of T9000 uh, to keep me sane, and I manually reconstructed V tables in it. And that was more fun. Uh, I also wondered, are there any vulnerabilities in here? Can I run code QL over this? Should I? I didn't. Um, I'm also still waiting for CISA to respond. I sent them the sample the day that I found it on the open deer. Yeah, nothing. Well, but the point is, those questions are all left unanswered, just like this code will be. Um, we're going to move on to the CSC tasking because this is frankly a lot more interesting. Um, so this is the contact SMS call kind of framework. That's how I understand it, at least. So what they do here is that this is for specifically searching through contacts for individuals. Um, what, what initially came to mind here is like the platform that was disclosed in the iSoon leaks, for example, where they have this entire network where they can just essentially look people up based off of their social media relations. Um, and this is, I feel like, what this kind of more broadly starts to play into in terms of this data exfiltration and espionage that they're doing specifically. So what they do with the search key is um, they actually base64 encode it and have it in a specific part of an array that gets passed as a parameter, uh, hence this part here. But we're not going to cover all of that. Um, the important stuff essentially is like the queries that I've included here, uh, I will be sharing the sample hashes as well. Um, and like the files themselves at some point with gray noise, so y'all can upload that. Um, but yeah, there is essentially just entire other infrastructure to this. But there, we, we haven't actually gotten to T9000 yet per se, because T9000 is modular plugins, which is what we're going to get to now. Um, so for whatever reason, there are three missing plugins. 
goes one through four, and then eight, nine, super. Um, I don't know. What I do find very interesting is that um, they have this no PIE um, for like no process independent execution. But when you think of it as no pi, as in like pi the number, we have the super hash being 3.14, which is just like a really cool small thing that I noticed. But yeah, um, each of these hashes can actually be found on virus total. They have been uploaded before, um, but they have no detections on them, which is quite curious and interesting. So if we quickly go back to the other sample that we had talked about at the beginning of this analysis, the sample that included the Google encrypted APK, um, that actually includes two different embedded plugins for the 2 and the 3 dash NoPi. Those, in whatever act of fate by whatever higher power that exists, were uploaded by the threat actors on this day two years ago. Like, I, I, I truly cannot make this up. Maybe God does exist. Do I have free will? Did I, did I have any choice in presenting this? Was it meant to be? Am I meant to be the raccoon of the thrunting community? I don't know. All I do know is that we're rhizomes, but only if there are lobsters. Deep cut for theory nerds. Hope you enjoy. Anyways, we're going to finish it off with some light analysis on the plugins. I call this the RICO method, aka reading interesting code. So 1.NoPy is a bit of general communications as well as phone parsing. So for example, we see them reaching out and trying to parse the ro.product.name, ro.product.real model. Um, they got Meizu in there. Uh, there are some more indicators for certain files that they may write to, um, certain prefixes, like for example, um, the SD card Android data, writing into the OLM, that kind of stuff. Uh, what we also see is that or from the start here is that the plugin one, two, three, four, all of that is included in every plugin itself because these are the no pi binary, so they don't have independent execution, you know. Um, so what's two dot or the two no pi? Um, this one is actually where you learn that they're targeting more than just Telegram, which we didn't learn from the APK. So other messaging apps that are targeted, for example, are WhatsApp. QQ Messenger, Telegram once again, obviously, and MicroMessage. Uh, this one focuses more so on the actual attachments and documents that are being sent across here, um, alongside the fact that it seems they're using open source software for this. Um, Minishell is an open source project. The creator of the open source Minishell has the initials of TJ, but the code doesn't line up. So I'm just a little bit confused on that one. But all that aside, um, what I also learned is that there's RTTI for for ARM binaries, which I personally didn't know existed, um, being a Windows nerd. But yeah, cool stuff. Um, there are obviously also queries in here and whatnot, um, which... We'll see in three NoPy, um, they actually just start like including fully copy pasted code with minor adaptations. So three NoPy includes OpenSSL as well as an adapted Weed Dump or WeChat Dump, um, which in itself includes functionality that extracts usernames, nicknames, what province, what city you're in, all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you looked at the strings a little bit from before you'd notice this weird utd underscore ce31 this was actually an indicator that the gta panda article from 2013 brought up uh, when this was still called plat one um as we see here the e svn plat one uh seems very similar to our our string here that we're seeing in the current version of d svn t9000 v2 t7000 um so these are just more indicators that we are, in fact, looking at the next evolutionary stage of this. Um, so for NoPy, it's an entire JPEG parsing library, like fully built out, um, basically only to parse the screen captures. Um, once again, UTD pops back up again. Um, yeah, 
I, I was starting to lose my mind during this. Regardless, uh, eight NoPy is WhatsApp specific. Um, so, for example, in the strings here, we will see an at s dot WhatsApp dot net. Uh, we're seeing SQL queries, um, the kind of um, like print string formatting, like we had app tg earlier. Now it's app wa for WhatsApp. Um, so they very much have a standardized exfiltration scheme for the data that they're sending. Um, Nine NoPy is specifically for Telegram media. Um, one of the paths that comes up in here where it gets written to is data data, com, Android, uh, pick with two Cs, blah, blah, blah. Um, they do, in fact, also call out to the Google Maps API. Um, I couldn't find their API key for that one in here, which was unfortunate. But they basically draw a, a big red circle around the location from document metadata that they extracted. Um, the super plugin, or as I like to call it, the super duper plugin, um, really goes to show that T9000 hasn't really changed all that much because this uh, user's Intel string is something that was very heavily referenced in the Unit 42 write-up from 2016. Um, on top of all of that, they they wrote open wrong a lot, and it kind of made me mad just a little bit. Um, but basically, super is what the name calls. It's kind of the super plugin. So like you'll have active app monitor, detect, you have calls to ADK, copy file, that kind of stuff. Um, so obviously, you want to know about configs, right? Where's their C2? Well, if you go to the plugin.dat, you throw that into uh, any hex editor you'd like. I like HXD. Um, the domain name is there. Out in plain text. Didn't have to do anything. Really easy. Um, Census actually didn't have that domain name in its vhost indexed, but uh, another lovely OSINT place, uh, Security Trails, told me that's the IP. If you see this IP and you're like, I feel like I've seen this before, you're correct. This is this is the IP of the open directory. Um, as you see, it has the 7386 port here. Uh, is the one in Moscow? Yeah, um, that that's that's our C two for it. So here's just random stuff that I couldn't really fit in contextually because they don't get xref'd. Um, but for example, an interesting IMEI, um, them writing into the SMS database um, directly. The fact that they use GCJ zero two to BD 9 LL for their coordinate type. Um, basically this part here, um, I never really figured out what it was, uh, but to my understanding, this 0CC175 is a WeChat UID, um, as they are grabbing this from the auth cache, which should be the UID, but regardless, either just other strings in here that can be used to gain more intelligence by people who have a lot more resources than I do. But if you kind of want to learn more about what all they would be going to do if they were to decrypt WeChat, um, this article is really good on it and covers basically all the methods that uh, Mustang Panda implements. So one thing is that they actually do stop spying. I, I want to give them a shout out for that. So they have an on-stop method, which unregisters all the important content observers even uninstalls it with a root check, which honestly is more than I can say for some enterprise software that I've seen, which doesn't do privilege or permission checks regardless. Um, we see here in the client uninstall, uh, we're armed at ring from data, SD card, and from slash system. Um, yeah, that that's, that's really that. Um, they did, in fact, take data structures, or one of the developers at one point or another took data structures because they use a hash map, um, which is awesome. And they monitor my travels to make sure that I'm okay, aka they check for photo metadata in my DCIM and see if that location has changed from where it was previously, and they send a notification to their C2. Anyways, uh, that's all. 
I am, in fact, very tired. Uh, future presentations and information that I may present may be on Kaiji, Root Devil or Satan, DDoS, a TA known as Red Team Pretender only within Chinese communities, and the lovely DPRK net. As I promised, Gray Noise does, in fact, have their own slide. Um, it's kind of a copy pasta, but I do want to say, and I do want to shout out Gray Noise for having some of the most comfortable merchandise I've ever had in my entire life. I love that shirt to death. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I'm on Net Noise Con. Mom, get the camera. Thanks and credits to Gray Noise Consensus, Azaka, Martian Fox, Gitworm, Hex Ice, obviously, Seastert CTI and Unit 42, and the one and only Jiang Ying giving me their IDA Pro license. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Awesome. That was a really great, uh, great presentation there. Um, best Thank presentation you. we've ever had from a raccoon. No, we uh, had a Let's go. Really, <laughs> um, lots of really great comments. I mean, the chat was running the entire time, uh, to be honest with you. So, uh, oh, lovely. But, okay. Yeah. Lots of, uh, claps, uh, fire emojis, all kinds of things going in the YouTube chat right now. Let's go. The raccoon army prevails. Yeah, <laughs> raccoon ri army rise up. Um, so let's see if there's any uh, questions in chat, please post them. Um, I don't have any like right off the top of my head because there was just um, kind of ongoing conversation yeah. in the chat while you were presenting. Um, but also that was really cool to hear that you got your start in the bug bounty scene since uh, obviously yeah. I was involved in that uh, scene as well. So that's really cool. Yeah, I, I got to say, it's um, I, I wouldn't say that people should expect much from Bug Bounty, aside from it should be a learning opportunity for you. If you make money from it and can sustain yourself, great, but don't try and force that. That's, yeah. that's the way that I viewed it. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. We had a question from Philip. Uh, <clears throat> For those domains that seem to have some kind of legitimate web page, did you do any other analysis on things like metadata and images or other files on the server? Uh, yes. So those are things that I have in my own research notes, uh, which unfortunately just wouldn't have made it into the presentation. But there, there were certain aspects of which like from these login pages, I think that's what you're talking about in regards to these domains. Um, like I did look at specifically like the buttons that were similar, like those HTML attributes to pivot and see from that. So there does exist infrastructure outside of what I had covered here, um, which is what I kind of wanted to get across with the, how can you keep hunting for this? Um, but yeah, like there, there are detections for those pages specifically that at least in my opinion, work decently well. Um, it is just in the end also contextualizing it with like what port numbers they're on and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. We had multiple questions about where to follow, like how can they follow you, keep up with you? Do you have a blog? Do you have a Twitter? Do you have, yeah. you know, any of the things Mastodon? Yeah. Uh, so I do have a Twitter. It is, it is currently private. I'll, I'll drop it in the gray noise discord after this talk. I don't necessarily want to drop this one on, on YouTube just due to yeah. the nature of the talk. Um, but yeah, like my blogs, um, I had my own blog for a while. Now I host them on a blog with a Discord server I kind of frequent a lot. Um, I, I'll, I'll throw all those links out in the Discord server and then anyone who wants them can grab them from there. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put up, uh, if you're not already, the Discord info is now at the bottom of the live stream um, in that little image there. So um, join us in the Discord server. That's actually how Floof Pone and I connected was in the Discord, uh, mm -hmm. Gray Noise Discord ser server. Um, well, cool. Well, I think we're out of time, but I really, really appreciate this chat. There was a lot of um, folks that enjoyed it as well in the in the live stream chat. So thank you so much, Floof Pone. We really appreciate it. Oh, of time. course. Thank you for having me. And honestly, it was really awesome. So yeah. <laughs>